We got to Afghanistan because in 2005, the Chinook force pulled out of Iraq and we all turned our eyes towards Afghanistan. And even at the start, Afghanistan was quite benign. The more British troops we got on the ground, the more kinetic it got, so more bullets were flying, more rockets. To the point where we were going into some landing sites that had been rocketed that morning. And then you find yourself, go and it becomes normal. And then you go in again and it was actually, you know, you're going in to get a casualty on the Mert, for example, which is the flying ambulance. And the, I mean, casualties don't just happen by accident in Afghanistan. It's usually because they've been shot or there's been an IED strike or something. So as a crew, we would wait for the, the troops in contact to be finished and then we would fly in. The others, then after that, it became a point where, you know, the casualty is bleeding out in the battlefields. The troops are still in contact, but you have to go in. And suddenly you find yourself flying into landing sites under a hail of bullets or with rockets and mortars coming towards the aircraft. But you're never going to not go. You know, that's again, coming back to that failure is not an option. You're never going to leave someone and not go. And there's not a single Chinook person, a, Ch a Chinook crew, that ever would have not gone to get a casualty out of a, a, a hot landing site. So back then though, joining the Air Force wasn't a very typical career for a young woman. What skills did you have to draw on then if you didn't have that support there in terms of following your dream? So I think I was quite independent. I think, you know, I'd always been quite an independent girl. I was, uh, as well as playing hockey, I was team captain. So I was kind of a leader anyway, or at least the person that rallies people around and, and kind of, you know, the team, like part of a team. I loved being part of a team. and. You know, I had a really good girly group at school who were very encouraging of what I was going to go and do. But the main kind of tenacity and will to succeed really came from when I joined up that first day and you're suddenly at Cranwell and everybody there is pretty much in the same boat as you. Everyone is like wide-eyed, rabbits in the headlight. They're all the same, most of them are the same age and no one has a clue what's going on. <laughs> and you're suddenly all in the club of newbies together. and All you want to do is help each other and succeed and you don't want to let each other down. You don't want to be the person who's falling out the back of the squad. You don't want to you know, be the person that gets recourse. You just help each other through. And that's where you really learn to dig deep. And talking about tenacity, it's a theme that seems to be through Liz McConaughey's life <laughs> from the very beginning. So tell me about the story with your interview, your journey to your oh, interview yeah. with the Air Force. <laughs> so the morning that I was coming over to England for my... Um, my final interview to get into the RAF. I, um, my parents were on holiday in Southern Ireland and I was driving up the only stretch of motorway in the whole of Northern Ireland. It's a very small stretch of motorway. <laughs> and the bearings collapsed in one of the wheels on my car. I was driving a little green Corsa and uh, the whole car, 360 up the motorway, hit the barrier about four or five times, rotated, and I ended up in the, in the hard shoulder. Car was mangled, uh, nearly a write off. And uh, I got out pretty shaken up. I managed to get the phone on the, the side of the lay-by on the side of the motorway and call the police. So they arrived and the first thing I said to them was, I've got to get to England, I've got to get to Cranwell. And they were like, no, calm down, explain what's happened. So I sort of did. I'm like, but I've got to get to England today. So when I explained to them why, I was so desperate to get to the airport. Um, and they said, okay, get in the car. And they put the blue lights on, drove me the whole way to the airport, got me into the airport. The lovely police officer lady came in with me and checked me in. <laughs> Which now looking back looks like a, some sort of criminal when you get escorted in with a policewoman to the airport. But, um, and yeah, I got the whole way over to England um, and it was my first time coming to England. So I got all the way to England, uh, went through the underground when itself is a pretty lonely place, despite the fact there's thousands of people there. It's a very soulless thing, the underground. And just, I think, uh, you know, by that point, it had suddenly dawned on me what had happened. I had a real meltdown in the underground and, and was crying while I was sat on the floor, but nobody wanted to know and ask if I was okay. But anyway, I got to Cranwell, got to the interview and they asked me, you know, lots of different questions about joining the Air Force and what I knew about the Air Force. And, and truth is, I, you know, I was probably not the most sparkling person in the interview because I was very young and naive. But at the end of the interview, they asked me how my morning had been and how my journey to Cranwell had been. And I explained. And they, I think if they'd had a box on their little tick sheet that said tenacious, they must have just gone, yep, <laughs> uh, big tick for this girl. And, uh, and yeah, I got accepted in. So you know, I've always said, I think if you want something enough and you've got like a really strong desire to make your dream come true, you will, you know, you'll, you'll keep fighting for it. And you'll do whatever you need to do to get there. So Liz, you were 19 years old 
when you joined the Air Force? You were the only female in your intake, Lou? There were three, three, three females on the intake. And then by the time I got to the front line, I was the only one. So did you ever have any feelings of imposter syndrome? And if so, how did you overcome that? So I think... Um, I think a lot of people in the forces suffer from imposter syndrome. It's that classic, you know, any minute now, people are going to find me out. They're going to be like, oh, she has no idea what she's doing. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, as I went through, you kind of, you're taken through all the, the skills and you learn all the skill sets from going from 19 year old Liz who lives in Northern Ireland to suddenly being a crewman on the front line. And, and even at that point, you're very much a, it's all quite novel. There's a certain element of going to war is quite novel, getting shot at still quite novel all those new things are quite novel and then you get to the point where it starts to wear you down and it's not novel anymore um, and it becomes very routine but I think the only way I ever realized that I actually did know what I was doing and what I was on about as in terms of role was when I became an instructor and suddenly people were asking me questions and I was able to impart the knowledge and I think for anyone watching this you know we're all very self-doubt everyone's got this doubt about their own ability and, and what they can do and what they know and the fear of being found out when actually, if you, you know, if people are approaching you and asking you advice, then you suddenly realize deep inside that you actually are capable and you do know what you're on about and you do have those skills and that knowledge set to pass on. So, you know, I'd certainly, anyone that really suffers from imposter syndrome, the best thing you can do is almost put yourself above the parapet and start to help other people who, you know, ask for advice because then you suddenly realize deep inside that the answers are there. So Liz, at the end of your time at Cranwell, you talk about this grueling physical fitness test and you talk about running so that your chest burned and your legs couldn't carry you or felt as if they couldn't carry you anymore. But you did carry on. So tell us about that moment and what made you carry on. So coming back to what we were talking about earlier, it's that like esprit de corps and you very much get that in the, air, in the forces generally is that, you know, team ethos of wanting to, each other to carry on. Um, and I had a you know, bunch of people who had just finished the test. They were all there at the finish line willing me on. But because the Air Force was all I'd wanted to do for two years at that point, failure wasn't an option. And I know that's a really cheesy line, but it was my only plan. It was my plan A. And I didn't have a backup plan. You know, I didn't want to go back to Northern Ireland. I didn't have, you know, any kind of job lined up. Whereas if you don't make it in the Air Force, this is where I'm going to go. I deliberately had never put those plans in, into place. Um, because then it would have given me too much of an option to, for failure. So I just had to dig deep and, and keep going for it. And there, there's a number of courses I look back on through my time in the forces, not just that physical test at the end of, uh, of basic training, but we do a lot of intense courses through our aircrew training, such as the Dunker, which is where you essentially get <laughs> strapped to a helicopter and then put underwater in various formats of like upside down and lights off and things like that. And you put your escape from this helicopter which is a, quite a mental battle to overcome. But again, if you don't pass the course, then you don't make it to the front line. So you just have to mentally overcome that, dig deep and, 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 and always just think, well, no one's died doing it yet, so I should be okay. Yeah. <laughs> and it's the same whenever we go into our escape and evasion training, which is our probably the biggest and hardest course you have to do before you go to Afghanistan. And again, it's, um, it's essentially being interrogated, you know, in a um, in quite controlled and quite nasty environment. But again, it's all training you for the front line, but it's brutal. It's it's very mentally taxing course and uh, you learn a lot about yourself. But if you fail the course, you're not going to the front line. And that was all I ever wanted to do. So, you know, I always think if you, you know, you have to want plan A enough and you'll not need a plan B, you'll make it happen. Did you also find other sources of support among your friends, colleagues? Did you find that you drew on those to help you through those times? Yeah, and I think there's probably, there is an element, although I was never ever single out you know in terms of being the only female it almost gives you a little when you're in the minority of anything and this comes from anyone in the disabled community as well watching this if you suddenly find yourself in the minority you've probably got more grit and determination than anyone else to prove everyone wrong and to kind of go well you know if they can do it so can I and I think you know as I got closer to the front line I, I was more and more in the minority there was less and less females and um I thought, yeah, well, you've come this far. You've got to keep going. You know, you're halfway across the river. Don't give up now, girl. <laughs> and that's the same for anyone who's in that kind of minority. And, you know, you don't have to be a victim. You can actually use it to your strength and dig deep and, and use that as a, as to prove people wrong. So you talk about being female in a male-dominated industry. And one of the things you talk about in your book is about actually embracing differences and diversity and playing to your strength. Can you tell us a little bit more about times when you did that? 
Yeah, and I've always said that. I've always, I mean, I was never ever made to feel, you know, odd or um, singled out for being a female. The, the lads at work always really embraced me as just one of the team. And I've always said, you know, it's the best person for the job. And that can be male, female, whatever. It can be tall, small, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, there's there's very specific incidents. Like the Chinook crewman is a quite a, like a physically challenging job. There's lots of humping and dumping kit around. And some of the kit that we use on the back of the aircraft is quite heavy. Uh, a five meter strop, for example, which is one of the underslung load strops that we put underneath the aircraft. You know, it's pretty heavy. And, um, and you know, the lads would be able to sling that with their shoulder and just walk back to the aircraft with it whenever we drop one off. Whereas I had to grab both ends and then drag it along the floor. And it would take me a, bit, a little bit longer, but I'd get there in the end. But equally, you know, we used to get internal vehicles inside the aircraft. And uh, being slightly smaller, you know, we'd have to get down the side of those to strap the vehicles down inside the aircraft. And there was many times where they'd be like, uh, Doris, which is my name, uh, can you shimmy down the side of the vehicle and you know, reach that strop or do this or climb underneath the vehicle? And, and you know, they couldn't do that. Um, and same for... Things like having little hands. It's just a simple thing, but some of the engine engine connectors for the the debris screens and the, the chips, which essentially catch bits of metals in the in the engine, um, they're really hidden away at the back of the engine. And most of the lads' hands were too big to reach them, but they were like, Liz. <laughs> So I always think that I think that everyone's got a strength and it is absolutely, you know, playing to that and using it to the best of your ability. So how important do you think diversity is then, not just in aviation or in the air force, but in the wider context? Oh, absolutely. Like, it's absolutely key, especially something like the Air Force, but, you know, in aviation, really, because I don't think, and this is the honest truth, I spent a day in the air where I didn't learn something from someone else on that crew. And that only comes from having four different people with four different ways of thinking, four different ways of approaching a problem and solving a problem. And, you know, the problem is the same. The problem always stays the same. The emergency always stays the same. You know, how you're going to pick up that underslung load, the underslung load is the same, but every single person will have a different way of doing it. And every single time when you see someone do something differently, that's when you learn. You know, if you have four robots on the back of an aircraft, you never, you wouldn't get that. And if everyone thought the same and did the same, you know, it can be actually quite dangerous, especially in the aviation world. And that's where diversity is absolutely key. Those free thinkers and different ways of looking at things. So Liz, talk to me about role models. Did you have any female role models during your time in the Air Force? So I'm really glad you asked that question because the truth is, no, you know, I was, there was so few females doing my job that there was never a female role model, but I had role models. You know, I had some of the best master air crewmen who, you know, were brilliant instructors or they just knew everything about the Chinook or they were, just, you know, and they were very well respected by other people. And I think that's a really key message for anyone is that it doesn't, just because I'm a female, don't, I don't have to have a female role model. Um, and equally, you know, you look at the disabled community, someone with a disability doesn't have to have a disabled person as their role model. They can have an able-bodied person and vice versa. You know, I look at Mike Miller-Smith in, in our ability and he is absolutely probably one of the best leaders and, and commanders I've ever worked for. And I have had some brilliant, you know, bosses in the Air Force. But the way Mike people manages and inspires people is just out of this world. You know, and he would be one of my role models now. And I think, you know, able-bodied people can have disabled people as their role models. And I think, you know, it doesn't have to be gender specific or able-bodied, not able-bodied specific. You can find role models everywhere. You know, it's whoever lights that fire inside you and sparks you to want to be a better person. So during your time in the forces, you deployed into war zones. You were subjected to danger. How did you feel? So... Danger, I mean, it's funny because a lot of people always say, oh, you're so brave. Like, bravery is n never usually a conscious action. Like, you know, I've been shot at lots of times and I always say that being shot at is like nearly being hit by a car. It's usually happened by the time you've noticed it's happened. But whenever I was in Iraq, um, I mean, I was quite young. I was 21. I was the youngest air crew to go to Iraq. And again, it was quite novel, I think, at the time. And the, some of the landing sites we went into in Iraq uh, were, had been mortared or rocketed the week before. And I remember thinking, oh, it's really dangerous, that. And then we would go to the same site and it had been rocketed and mortared the day before. Um, and I was like, oh, it's a bit more, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the danger's upping a little bit. And that normality bar seemed to creep up really slowly. And we got to Afghanistan because in 2005, the Chinook force pulled out of Iraq and we all turned our eyes towards Afghanistan. And even at the start, Afghanistan was quite benign. 
because there weren't that there wasn't that many British troops in the ground. We only had a small footprint of British troops around sort of um, Bastion and Sangin, which is one of the, the forward operating bases up the Helmand Valley. But generally speaking, there, there wasn't that many British boots on the ground. Um, so again, we were going to some sites that had been rocketed the, like the day before, and, and that was still you know dangerous, but not too dicey. Anyway, the more British troops we got on the ground, the more kinetic it got, so more bullets were flying, more rockets. And and that you know that's always going to be the case. The more British troops you get there, and then stuff happens. To the point where we were going into some landing sites that had been rocketed that morning. And then you find yourself, go, and it becomes normal. And then you go in again and it was actually, you know, you're going in to get a casualty on the Mert, for example, which is the flying ambulance. And the, I mean, casualties don't just happen by accident in Afghanistan. It's usually because they've been shot or there's been an IED strike or something. So as a crew, we would wait for the, the troops in contact to be finished and then we would fly in. The others, then after that, it became a point where, you know, the casualty is bleeding out in the battlefields. The troops are still in contact you have to go in and suddenly you find yourself flying into landing sites under a hail of bullets or with rockets and mortars coming towards the aircraft and it becomes very normal so your normality bar over the years had got so high that I was very desensitized to danger at that point because you've got a job to do you're trained you've trained for it and you ultimately you've got to get that casually out of the ground so it's almost like you're task focused but you're never going to not go you know that's again coming back to that failure is not an option you're never going to leave someone and not go and there's not a single chinook person, a chin a chin crew, that ever would have not gone to get a casualty out of a, a, a hot landing site. But yeah, that desensitization to danger was quite prolific, not just to myself, but a lot of the Chinook force. And it's certainly something now I look back and I'm out of the forces. Um not just the desensitization to to danger, but to trauma as well, because as with the the danger ramping up a lot of the trauma that we saw on the back of the aircraft on the flying ambulance started to ramp up as well. So it went from going someone who'd been in a vehicle accident to somebody who'd then been, you know, shot in the leg to somebody who'd then been shot in the head to then, you know, torsos and bodies coming over the ramp. And that that escalated again very, very slowly, but you suddenly became really immune to it. And I look back now, I might, you know, once I come out of the forces of just how stuff like that, normal stuff like that in life, which we should feel emotion about, was completely desensitized to. So how did that then affect you when you then left the air force 17 and a half years later having been exposed to that really high level of danger to then everyday normal civilian life what was the adjustment like how did you find it so coming out of the forces is probably the hardest thing i've ever done that you know that transition where you're suddenly you haven't got your bat suit on as i call it every day you know you're not wearing the uniform that like really it's it's not just your identity but it's like your shield it's like your you know like your Wonder Woman costume you're okay when you're wearing your uniform um and you know ironically you know I've been in the most dangerous places in the world in the forces but I've never felt more vulnerable suddenly when you're not wearing that uniform and you're just Liz from Basingstoke <laughs> not Liz who's a Chinook crewman um but I'd become so desensitized like I said to that trauma and you know and the danger I was never able to admit that I was feeling something. I'd, I'd locked up any feeling and any capability of admitting emotion um, so deep down inside that when I was starting to really struggle with my identity and, and, and being a civilian and, and kind of missing that sense of purpose and, and feeling, I mean, it's almost like losing a person. It's like you're mourning a chapter of your life, that, that thing that you used to do. And there's nothing harder than saying, I used to be this, you know, and you know, I think the disabled community, again, coming back to why we're doing this today, you know, if they've had an accident or something's happened, they used to be this person and now they're, suddenly their life has changed forever. And it's adapting to that new identity of who you are. It's really hard. And I was not able to ask for help. I was, you know, couldn't admit to people that I was struggling because I got so used to just locking those feelings away and just keeping them deep down inside. So what advice would you give to someone then who is, struggling with a major change in their life, whether it's leaving the forces or whether it's, you know, bereavement or the, any kind of major change, what advice would you give to them to handle it? So I think the key is to be able to stand in front of the mirror and look in the mirror and, and you know, look really deep inside and know the key of the fibre that makes you up of who you are. Because ultimately, you know, the girl looking in the mirror at the end of a 17-year career in the RAF was still the same girl who was 18 looking in the mirror wanting to join the RAF. The same person was looking back at me. It was all the stuff in between that had changed me. So that's really important. But one thing I learned through a lot of my PTSD counselling is to 
you know, find the new identity and really, you know, and write it down. I mean, I spent days, you know, with the counsellors going, but Liz, you know, you write poetry now because one of the first things I did going through my counselling was I started to write poetry before the book. And my counsellor was like, you're a poet, Liz. She's like, I'm not a poet. I just write a bit of poetry. And she said, well, that makes you a poet. And, you know, we were talking about imposter syndrome earlier. I've written a book now, but I still don't think of myself as an author. And she was like, you're an author. And it's like, well, yeah, I suppose I am. But sometimes it's not until you write it down that you, um, that you really start to believe it. So, yeah, I think it's really key for anyone who is struggling through that transition is start to look at the, and embrace the new clothes that you're wearing. You know, it's like getting a new suit. Embrace the new, you know, I am a, I'm a veteran. I, I refer to myself as a veteran a lot. And, you know, I'm hopefully still quite young as a veteran. But I think that's really important for me to be able to acknowledge that instead of saying something like negative language, saying I used to be in the forces, which is quite a negative sentence to say that I'm a veteran. It's quite a proud sentence. And I think it's just changing that language, you know, to be like almost like a survivor. I'm, I'm proud of what I've done or... And, and just repackaging your language and making it positive about you, not negative.